Hello and welcome to Innovation Celebration, the show where we celebrate recent advancements in science and technology, the people who make them possible, indeed the ideas that make them possible, and the ways in which they enhance human flourishing. I'm Thomas Walker. And I'm Angelica Worth. And I'm going to start us off today by talking about AlphaFold 2, which is an, an artificial intelligence program that can predict the structures of proteins and other complex molecules. And for me, I find this to be a very interesting um, area of science because this it's this intersection between technology and biology um, yeah. and ways in which you can use one to better understand and manipulate the other. So uh, artificial intelligence, you know, conjures up images of, of data and, and, you know, androids from various different films, but this isn't robotics. This isn't people who, you know, this isn't machines that can think and feel so much. It's more right. software that can learn. It's, um, you know, it, it can be fed information and then learn how to extrapolate based on that. Precisely. Yes. We're not talking about robots that are going to take over the world or anything from Star Trek. <laughs> we are just talking about something that will deepen our understanding of how the world around us is structured so that we can work with it. And I'm going to get into some specifics of how this program has already helped us do that in the short time it's been public. So. AlphaFold 2 specifically was created by DeepMind, which is a company based in the UK, owned by um, Alphabet. The same Alphabet that owns Google. That'd be the one. Yeah. Um, but DeepMind has only been around for, I think, about 10 years or so, but they're doing a lot of work in um, trying to discover how artificial intelligence can solve various problems, including this problem of figuring out how proteins are structured, what the precise um, 3D atomic structure of a complicated molecule is because you can't just look through a microscope and see that. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, so the team that's leading the charge at DeepMind on this project is called uh, Demis, uh, the, I'm sorry, is led by Demis Hassabis <laughs> and John Jumper. <laughs> Not the whole team, that's one person's name, Demis Hassabis and then G John Jumper are the two that are leading this team. Both great names. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and so this, uh, as I mentioned, this is called AlphaFold 2. So they did have a version, and that's the name for the code that does the actual work here. Um, there was an AlphaFold, an original AlphaFold, and they brought it to a competition called CASP, um, which is stands for the Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction. And basically, uh -huh. it's a competition for people who have programs like this that predict the structure of different proteins to bring it all together and prove how well it works in front of each other. Um, and AlphaFold originally did quite well in 2018, but they took it back and made it better, significantly so, such that in 2020, it swept the competition completely with an accuracy rate of 92.4%, which is unheard of. That sounds very impressive, but what does it practically mean? <laughs> So practically, it means that this AI is able to predict with a 92.4% accuracy rate what proteins actually look like. Um, and there were there are methods that can be used to do this experimentally. Um, and so that's how both how they teach the AI and how they measure its success is by using the ones that have been determined experimentally. So as we've talked about before, models are only as good as their actual predictive ability. If they're not lining up with what we're seeing experimentally, they're not good. Yeah. Um, and so this is exactly a case where that is the standard. The percent you're able to match reality is the percent to which you're um, doing correctly in, in this field. And so they, <laughs> um, this program and others like it give the AI a solved, solved in quotes, um, protein structures, which means structures that they have determined experimentally. Right. Um, and then they give the AI the amino acid sequence of the one that they want it to solve. And the amino acid sequence, um, because if you remember, proteins are made up of amino acids. And amino acids are directly coded for in your DNA. DNA excuse me. So once you have the genome of an organism, or even just the gene you're interested in, which for humans, thanks to the Human Genome Project, we have the entire genome, um, then you know what the amino acid sequence is. But just because you know what the amino acid sequence, is, acid sequence is, you don't know what the whole protein is going to look like. And that's what these programs are trying to do. Because the right. experimental methods that exist take a long time to figure out. Um, they take a lot of people with very specialized training and the equipment required costs millions of dollars. So it's easy to see why we might want 
a solution that's easier to use uh, and cheaper and quicker. Yeah. Um, and so there was this uh, AlphaFold 2, as I said, swept the competition in 2020, um, but they didn't publish their code until July 15th, 2021, when they published at the same time as a rival code called Rose TTA Fold that does essentially the same thing, um, called uh, produced by researchers at the University of Washington. The team was led by Mink Young Baek and David Backer. Um, and so for, what, for the non-Americans among us that's that's the big Washington in the west <laughs> not <Yeah>. Washington DC <laughs> right um, indeed and so AlphaFold 2 has already predicted uh, the structure of 350,000 proteins and complex molecules um, and that information is now available online, accessible to the public. DeepMind published it about a week after their actual code was published with the help of a, a group in Europe, I forget their name, um, to make this public library accessible to everybody else. So what does that mean in, you know, the rest of, for the rest of science and the rest of the world? Um, there's a really tight link between how structures are shaped and how they work. Um, in my biology classes, this was taught to us as form follows function, um, and that things have a particular form because they serve a particular function, and those two are really closely linked. So once you know one, you can figure out the other, and you can work with the other. So AlphaFold 2 specifically has already been used to figure out, to find some new um, enzymes that help break down plastic much faster. It also correctly predicted two of the proteins um, produced by the virus that causes COVID-19. And it's been used to identify a number of potential uh, candidates for possible drugs uh, because drug makers need to know what the proteins are on the outside of the cells that they're interested in targeting so that they can make the proper um, chemicals that will interact with those proteins. Um, and so obviously, you know, we've been taught, we've already talked about pharmaceutical innovations on this show. You guys know it takes a while uh, for things to develop, but this is the first step is them knowing what they need. Uh, and so there's already been some exciting potential applications. Uh, and it, it, it massively accelerates the, um, the process if you have a, an, an intelligent machine that could do the work of, of many months of, or possibly more of, of, you know, manual research. Precisely. The, that 350,000 number is actually double the number of protein structures we already knew from experimental methods. Mm -hmm. And it's only been, like I said, this AlphaFold 2 was completed last year. So yeah. this, I think it's probably worth noting this, this doesn't replace the old fashioned method of determining these structures. It, it, it's, no. a predict, it's a predictor. It won't always be spot on, but it will still help advances move a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And these researchers have identified some areas where certain proteins just have a really um, unusual structure that doesn't follow the patterns that the AI can recognize yet. And there's also the fact of, even when we know the structure, we don't always know how the structure interacts with something else. So there's still more areas of research and it, you know, models don't trump the real world ever. So, yeah. but it's still very useful. I think awesome. That's all I had on that. Cool. Well, um, so I want to move on to uh, my main feature for today, which is something that I found quite exciting because it's a really interesting example of a situation where two seemingly not disconnected but seemingly you know disparate fields of research have have overlapped nicely uh, it reminds me of the principle that you know we live in one universe uh, one integrated universe and all of these disciplines physics chemistry astronomy paleontology biology they are all aspects of the same reality and they all intersect in different ways so um you know, we know from the fossil record and, and from sediment and things like that, that um, so about 500 million years ago, um, complex animal life as we know it today evolved. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about the discovery in China of a, a big fossil graveyard from that period. And um, the first emergence of complex animal life is a bit before that, but long time before that, um, going back two and a half billion years, really, um, there's single celled organisms which gradually develop um, into, well, so cyanobacteria come along, which is the first one that photosynthesized, which you covered in relation to crops or something? Yes, the cyanobacteria were being used to create an organic fertilizer. So. Yeah, so they, they came along about 2.3 billion years ago, and um, and then they, they sort of pioneered photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Um, and then you know, more complex 
plant life came along after that and um, that over time oxygenated the atmosphere um so you know for us to exist as as you know all animal life really to exist in the form that we know it today requires a level of oxygen in the atmosphere that just doesn't occur uh, you know what you might call naturally i.e before life comes along so um, the Earth's atmosphere after it formed was very heavy on carbon dioxide. There was sulfur present, there were, um, nitrogen was there, that, but there was very little in the way of oxygen. Because oxygen is, isn't something that sort of forms you know, out, out of the, the process that the Earth formed through. It's, it's a lot of volcanism, a lot of asteroid impacts, and um, you don't find oxygen in the atmospheres of, of other planets. So, um, so where did it come from has been a question for a long time. And um, as I say, the, the appearance of cyanobacteria 2.3 billion years ago is, is part of the answer to that, which is that that initial photosynthesis process, you know, photosynthesis you take in, the plant takes in, like this one behind me, takes in carbon dioxide, splits it up, uses the carbon uh, and puts oxygen back out, sort of an inversion of what we do when we breathe. And um, that, however, only accounted for a moderate increase in the level of, of oxygen in the atmosphere. It, you know, there are graphs of this thing, and it's like yeah. a very slow increase for over a billion years, I think it is. Yes, yeah, so for, from 2.3 to 0 0.7 billion years, it's about, two, about a billion and a half years uh, of just this gradual climb, which is nowhere near enough to get the oxygen level up to where animal life as we know it could exist. Uh, then about 700 million years ago, there is you know, 0 0.7 billion years ago, there is a, a dramatic increase, um, which is, I have the name for it here, so I went neoprotozoic oxygenation event. Um, protozoic generally refers to the sort of animal era of geological history, so this is neoprotozoic, like the beginning of that. And, so this is right uh, when large organisms were starting to... Yeah, so um, this is a little before the start of the Cambrian period where sort of life as we know it, Jim, today first appears, but um, it's the start of the period before that where the first sort of significant sort of animal life comes into being. And um, so enter onto the, onto the stage Judith Clatt, um, who was uh, undertaking work um, in a sinkhole, well, she was in the sinkhole, but she was studying a sinkhole at the base of Lake Huron. For Again, for the non-Americans among us, this is the, one of the Great Lakes that's on the eastern side of Michigan, sort of between Michigan and, and Canada. She was doing a postdoc at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, which is on that side of Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and the thing is with this this sinkhole at the bottom of the lake, these lakes are you know basically oceans, and you know at the, in the bottom of here there was this environment that was very heavy on sulfur and um, low in oxygen, so it sort of was analogous to the ocean floor environment on on Precambrian Earth, and um, and down there she discovered two well not, you know, she studied um, the the life of two different types of microbes. One of them is uh, white chemotropic bacteria, and they make their energy from the sulfur that's around in that environment. And the other was purple cyanobacteria, which is what we're talking about, that first form of bacteria that, that used photosynthesis to produce oxygen. And um, she noted that although the energy output effectively of the, um, the get, chemotropic bacteria, am I reading that right? Yeah, chemotropic. Chemotropic, chemotropic. Was sort of consistent, whereas the uh, energy output of the cyanobacteria varied enormously depending on the amount of sunlight they get. Now that sort of seems intuitive in the same sense that you know if you have a solar panel and a nuclear power station, as Alex Epstein talks about at length, you know the, the sunlight comes and goes, so the amount of energy you get from the solar panel is going to be variable versus the power station is just going to continuously output the same amount of power. Similar situation here, but there's an added complication. Um, which is that the longer that the cyanobacteria photosynthesizes for, the more of it it does in that time. So she she put it in terms of, I think you can double check on this, is if you have two 12 hour blocks, you don't get as much oxygen output as if you get one 24 hour block. It's That's kind right, of cumulative. Yeah. So the more daylight blocks you're getting, not the more net daylight there is, just the more daylight per block of daylight that happens significantly exponentially more oxygen output you get from the cyanobacteria so that set her mind looking well hang on when there was that big increase 700 million years ago was there suddenly more daylight um that's where the astronomy connection comes in so um 
the Earth and the Moon is an interesting anomaly in the solar system. You don't normally get a small rocky planet with a gigantic moon that's a quarter its size. Um, but what actually happened there is that there was a collision between two planets early in the formation of the solar system, and then the Moon and the Earth formed out of the after effects of that collision. Uh, so you initially had the very large moon very close to the Earth. It was only three times the Earth's diameter. It's now 32 times the Earth's diameter away. So it had been enormous in the sky. Uh, and the Earth was spinning like crazy after this um, collision. And the moon being so close and so massive exerted a drag effect and slowed down the Earth's spin. The moon is also receding from the Earth, has been that whole time. So the Earth's rotation slows down, the moon gets further away. So that slowing down continues, but sort of reduces in speed as the, as the moon's gravitational effect is becoming less and less significant. It's still very significant. It lifts the oceans every day, but you know, it's not like when it was right on top of us. Um, so that, that there's a couple of different models, again, models of how that slowdown has happened over the course of the last four and a half billion years. And what that precise timeline looked like. We're not exactly yeah. sure. Yeah, so according to different models, like at the 2.3 billion year ago period we're talking about when the cyanobacteria first come along, you're looking at a day length of about 14, maybe 18, pushing up towards 20 at the most, I think, um, hours as opposed to the 24 that we know today. So that's come from three at the point of the collision, very rapidly goes up to about 10 and then more gradually from there. So there is evidence um, from iron deposits and um, other geological evidence from around 700 million years ago that there might have been a perturbation in the moon's orbit at that point. Um, and that may have led to an increase, a sort of sudden increase in the length of daylight at that point. So you know, if, if that's true, and this obviously needs more study, then the astronomy has a direct impact on the biology at that point. And, um, and that increase in daylight would help explain why there's a sudden increase in the level of oxygenation in the atmosphere at that point. So um, yeah, this is interesting on two levels. One of them is, is that intersection of, of disciplines. And, and you know, if you talk to academics about this, they occasionally um, almost regretfully sometimes talk about interdisciplinary research and having to work with colleagues in other fields. And the thing is, is you know, you're all scientists. It's, it's all one field, really. And I think it's helpful to think of it in those terms. The other thing is that this fills in an understanding of, of where complex life came, come, came from. And um, it reminds me of, of one thing that people sometimes say, which is, look at the Earth. It's so perfect for us to live on. You know, it has all the right conditions. But of course, we evolved on this planet. So yeah, it's going we to be right have if the conditions weren't right. Yeah, or if we'd evolved somewhere else, then the conditions here wouldn't be right for us. But moreover than that, this you know, highlights the point that also the environment we live in was created by life to some extent as well. You know, um, it was almost the original pollution, really, like cyanobacteria just started changing the climate and, you know, altering the world. And so, um, you know, life has always been doing that in one way or another. And <laughs> otherwise we'd still be living on a sort of, you know, dead rock. And, um, and yeah, so it, these, these systems reinforce each other in different ways. And I, I think it's quite interesting to, understand that, that history in as much detail as we can. Side note, this is why I really like ecology as a study, because it focuses on how different organisms and their environment interact. It's very complicated, and I didn't expect the class I took on it to be as hard as it was, but this is still focused on biology, but it does look at all these kinds of relationships and seeks to make the kind of integrations that Judith Klatt did in this case that can completely revolutionize our understanding of something. So moving on to our honorable mentions then, uh, the first one is from Australia. So, well, so the, the place that wants to kill you, <laughs> where, where every everything that crawls out of the underbrush might be a, a you know, murderous, venomous critter. And the plants. The plants also want to kill oh, you. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing raised as Steve Owen found out to his detriment. But this is actually a medical innovation um, coming out of the place, the country that wants to kill you. Um, mm. Well, his flora and fauna want to kill you, rather. I don't think the actual Australians want to kill you. <laughs> um, so in this case, we are talking about a spider from a funnel web spider from Fraser Island, which the indigenous people call Kagari. Um, and the venom from these spiders, which can kill you, uh, contains a protein called HI1A that is it's being researched to save patients who have had heart attacks. 
And the researcher leading the charge on this one is a Dr. Peter McDonald from the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute, working with his colleagues at the University of Queensland. Um, and basically, uh, once you have a heart attack, then your the heart sent, actually, let me just read the quote that explains a little bit better from one of the researchers working on the project, a Dr. Paul Plant. He explains, quote, after a heart attack, blood flow to the heart is reduced, resulting in a lack of oxygen to the heart muscle. The lack of oxygen causes the cell environment to become acidic, which combines to send a message for heart cells to die, unquote. So what this venom does is it stops those single signaling cells that tell the other cells that they need to die. They don't die, they continue functioning, and then the heart attack patient can recover more easily. This uh, is one of those ways in which your body loves to sabotage you. This is it's like aging. It, it tells itself to die. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more of these things we can intervene and prevent, the better. Right. And, and heart attacks are, of course, the leading cause of death in the world. Um, and so if we could actually prevent more deaths and another application of this they were talking about is making hearts uh, healthier for transplant for patients who need a heart transplant, uh, such as my uncle. My uncle had a heart transplant nine years ago. Um, so the importance of having a healthy heart for a, a donor is one that I'm very familiar with. Um, and so it's currently being studied, this um, HI1A protein is currently being studied in beating heart cells derived from stem cells, which we've talked about on this program before. I think that was you, honey. That yes, so it was just, yeah, uh, it rang a bell for me because uh, we talked about growing beating heart cells in space. Um, that was to do with growing new organs if my memory serves me well. <laughs> I think that was right, yes. yes. Um, so they're testing on there now. We're not sure why, um, but what we're seeing is that they're not expecting to start proper clinical studies for another two to three years. I don't know if that's a regulatory issue or a funding issue or what the problem is there. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a concern that, um, you know, the ethics committees and bureaucratic approvals you have to I don't know what the situation is like in Australia specifically or if, or if that testing is going to be done elsewhere but the hurdles you have to jump through to even do human testing because a lot of this testing was done on rats from when I looked into this as well and uh, or on beating heart cells as you said so they, they've gone through those two stages but to do the live testing you, you have to get all the ethical approvals and then even after that's happened there's that whole process of FDA or whichever authority in different you know areas um, and or, I mean, meanwhile, people don't just stop getting heart disease while you're waiting for, you know, for all the red tape to go through. So I mean, it, it, it does Dr. require said, if the patient is waiting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it does require testing, but also if somebody's only other option is death, then, you know, take yeah. the risk as far as I'm Absolutely. concerned. We should definitely study things to understand their side effects, but patients should be able to take experimental treatment when their options are unknown side effects or death. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the, the last note I just wanted to make on this is that this protein is also being looked at for other applications, the most exciting of which is um, Glenn King, who's also from the University of Queensland, is studying its ability to protect stroke patients. Um, but a couple other applications is to help heal what are called chronic wounds, which are just wounds that don't want to heal properly. Occasionally, we get these wounds that don't follow the healing process um, for one reason or another. And so these this this protein is being looked at to help with that. And then on a more cosmetic commercial side, um, it's supposed to help with hair loss. So we'll see how that goes. I that's think that's all I had on that one. Again, it's you know, ways your body sabotages you. You just like, you know, gets rid of your hair for no reason. So mm -hmm. yeah, the more we can control these things, the better. Right. Um, so a little one for the astronomy geeks like me next, um, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope um, captured the actual moment that a, super, a supernova occurred for the first time. So um, supernovas, I think I've talked about on the show before a couple of times, but um, that is when a, a large star, sort of eight solar masses or more, eight times the mass of the sun or more, uh, reaches the end of its life and instead of just growing into a red giant like the sun will uh, it, they, these really massive stars collapse in on themselves and then explode violently uh, and that process actually creates most of the elements um, that exist in the world so the sort of you know, the simplest elements from hydrogen up to, to iron sorry um, in, in the periodic table forming the cores of regular stars when they get heavy and run out of fuel at the end of their lives they fuse up the periodic table but they generally can't go any further than iron um, whereas these massive stars, when they collapse and explode, you know, the energy is so high that it fuses basically everything else in the periodic table in, in that event. Um, mm. So that's where most of the um, materials around us sort of formed originally. 
Um, but this particular star is a billion light years away. So yeah, this is not at all local to us. This is in another galaxy, another galactic cluster. Um, generally, there's one supernova per hundred years per galaxy. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, um, which is you know hundred thousand light years across, um, is only likely to have one of these happen every hundred years or so. And the chances of them being in our neighborhood just numerically is a lot lower because there's other sides of the galaxy where we you know would struggle to even know they were happening. But um, it, from time to time, they do actually happen proximate to Earth in, in a way that's very noticeable. This happened in 1066, the year of the Norman invasion of England. But meanwhile, at the same time that was going on, um, the star at the center of what is now the Crab Nebula blew up. And for two weeks, there was a bright light in the sky that you could read by at night and you could see during the day. My goodness. Um, yes, yeah, so it would be an incredible thing to, to see. And um, and they say nowadays, if you look in the location where that was, you see the Crab Nebula, which is the remains of that star just expanding through space. But um, there is a star in our night sky today, Betelgeuse, the red one at the bottom of Orion's, you know, egg timer. And um, that is teetering on the brink of, of going boom. It's already a red supergiant. It's, it's the size of a decent chunk of our solar system, just this one star and um, it's fluctuating it's losing mass and pulsing in and out it's doing all sorts of crazy stuff which makes us think that it's on the verge of of going nova going supernova uh, that could happen tomorrow literally uh, it could happen hundreds of thousands of years from now these processes go on for a long time so uh, one of the it, big advantages of having seen this other supernova then is we know what to expect a little bit more so yeah, it's, right? it's an understanding of the process and mm. um i say i mean this is a star like a, a giant nuclear reactor in space exploding uh, and, and you know uh, a, an object just billions of times more massive than, than the earth and you know the amount of energy output from it is, is is enormous um so we do need to be on the lookout for charged particles raining out of the sky or you know massive increases in radiation levels if, if one nearest goes and um and betelgeuse is is the sort of most likely candidate for that it is 600 light years away so it's quite some distance it's probably at a distance where radiation levels from it would be noticeable but not significant mm -hmm. i don't think it's going to cause a, a like a huge you know outbreak of skin cancer or anything like that there are extinctions in the geological record that may be linked to supernova events closer to the, the earth than that which would cause you know increases in cancer and things like that radiation poisoning but um, we should be all right on that front. But still, yeah, actually seeing this up, not up close, it's, it's so far away, but you know, in detail, as it happens, it's such a rare event to begin with. And then um, you know, actually catching the moment that that happens um, does help understand a lot more about st uh, star formation, star death, wh where chemistry comes from and um, what to be on the lookout for if Beetlejuice suddenly goes. Well, that's exciting, a little bit concerning, but exciting. <laughs> Uh, so the last thing I wanted to talk about today is the invention of a new device, a new uh, form of thermogenerator um, that would be much cheaper than the ones we currently have. So a thermogenerator is just something that uses heat, which is often given off as like a waste byproduct from other processes uh, and turns it into energy, usable energy. Uh, so this is actually what pow powers the Mars rovers, um, but it uses really, really expensive um technology and equipment so it hasn't really been commercially viable um, but one of the main advantages of it is that it gives off no emissions and no waste so there's a researcher a material scientist at northwestern university whose name is mercury and um, who's he and his team um, have been working on this for a number of years now um, at least since 2016 and they have found that a number of readily available materials is tin, um, uh, sodium, bromine, and uh, selenium can be used together to make these devices in a much cheaper uh, fashion. So the thing with thermogenerators, the reason they're so difficult is it works basically by having a hot side and a cool side and the heat gets pushed from one side to the other, but you have to be able to keep the cool side cool. It can only, it has to be what's called a semiconductor where only part of it actually conducts heat. This is really difficult to do very well. And they 
were finding that their effective thermogenerators were eventually heating up and having a problem uh, until heat seems to be the answer here. Uh, they developed a new solution, a new technique that used heat to actually isolate the um, elements they were working with such that they didn't um, have any disruptions from oxygen, which is what was causing the uh, cool side to heat up basically without going too much into detail there. So the ramifications for this for human flourishing is that we could have devices that generate heat from, or sorry, <laughs> that generate energy from heat, which is essentially a waste product without creating any new waste um, you know, itself at a cost mm -hmm. that could actually be commercially viable um, in the next several years, most likely, so. Awesome. Um, well, my last one has a little bit to do with energy uh, generation as well in a different sense. Um, so this is a sort of close to me story in several ways, um, most notably geographically, I think, because um, this is taking place at Cranfield University, which um, was originally known as the College of Aeronautics in England, um, and then became, uh, in this country, we have a difference between colleges and universities, and, and it became a university body that can actually award degrees and carry out, you know, doctoral research and things uh, in, in the 90s. And um, really un uniquely for a university, Cranfield actually has its own airport. And, um, and as I say, it's a very much aeronautics and technology focused university, and, um, and, and particularly on aviation. And um, Bobby Sethi, Sethi, I'm not entirely sure how to say his name, but um, he's been leading a project there, um, working on a project there um, about trying to develop uh, basically an aircraft engine that runs on hydrogen. And um, this has been done before in the sense that, well, it's being done in parallel by other companies um, who are using what's known as hydrogen fuel cells which have been used for decades really as onboard power for spacecraft like the space shuttle uh, and more recently to power things like buses and, and cars. Which uh, is which crazy are... sounding really because hydrogen has this um, perception of being really unstable and likely to cause explosions. Yeah so I mean I was just talking about stars going boom and, and you know stars are just hydrogen basically like burning away in space and um, you know uh, yeah I, I mean Hydrogen got a bad rep in 1937 um, when the Hindenburg airship crashed. Uh, and so, you know, really for the first time in, in history, the world was filled with live pictures of this just explosive disaster happening on screen and, you know, just fire falling out of the sky. Um, that accident had a lot more to do with the construction of the airship and the materials that we used on, on the sheeting on it than the actual use of hydrogen itself. Airships got a bad name really for no good reason. They're actually quite a cool idea I think for I think that's another way that aviation might change in the future is that fixed um, you know rigid airships might make a comeback but, um, but that's another matter um, the the thing is that hydrogen fuel cells have been used for a long time as, and they're as actually quite of, safe of a lot a source of electrical power yeah I mean I think they're actually probably a better way if you want to do zero emission cars of, of doing that than batteries are um, and we in London we have hydrogen buses driving around and they, they, they've been for 20 years they don't blow up or anything they're quite safe <laughs> Um, but what this team is trying to do is an entirely different thing to fuel cells. They are trying to get engines to run on hydrogen instead of running on kerosene, which oh. um, you know, as, um, as aircraft engines do currently. And um, so, you know, the interesting thing here is, you know, instead of trying to make electric planes work, it's trying to have an engine that brings in thrust like a jet engine, fuses with, with fuel and fires out the back to give you that jet thrust that, you know, an electric aircraft can't deliver. So, you know, electric planes you know, might work as a short hops um, thing. And there's a couple of projects doing that at the moment. Zero Avia is one um, who are actually based at Cranfield as well. And there's another project, Fresham, uh, working in the Orkney Isles in Scotland. They're both trying to develop short hop electric aircraft or hydrogen fuel cell planes that you know, can um, do those shorter journeys, but to, to have the thrust to move a large aircraft over long distances uh, at reasonable speeds, you really want a jet engine. And, and these guys have now actually succeeded in, in making that reaction work safely. So um, it's an exciting prospect because, you know, sort of regardless of your position on, on, on climate change and the like, you know, there is, there's firstly, there's massive public pressure to go greener. And, and the aviation industry is, is kind of the most targeted by that campaign 
and and it, you know if if you can make aviation greener then that equips it better to survive as an industry in the present sort of political climate so to speak uh, and I, i'm quite concerned about the future of the aviation industry because i think it's such a good thing it, it's it brings us i mean it's literally brought you and i together but it it brings people together across the world it it breaks down those barriers between cultures and nations that you know, we, we kind of artificially put up and I'm, I'm very sad at, uh, well, the coronavirus situation in particular, and then that might run onto the sort of environmental push against aviation, you know, re-entrenching us in our nations and break, cutting us off from, from other countries and other cultures and aircraft, the jet age is such a good thing at, at breaking that down. It also, you know, kind of makes travel accessible. Travel, international travel used to be this elite thing you know, if, if most people just went on holiday, you know, nearby, and then, you know, if you were really wealthy, you could go to France or something. And now it's like, you know, can you can go anywhere you, in the world. Anyone can go anywhere who, who makes, you know, even a moderate amount of money. You can, you can pretty much go anywhere in the world for, you know, six, seven, eight, you know, up to a thousand dollars at most, you know, if you're willing to sit in coach class. And, you know, I, I would like to see that innovation continue with, with projects like Boom, you know, making those journeys quicker and, and hopefully cheaper as well. One advantage of this, by the way, is it pro probably would in the long run actually make it cheaper to operate as well. Mm. If you can get more energy efficient aircraft, I was, I was watching a video about another of the fuel cell projects and, and the woman in that was saying we, we're trying to make this cheaper for customers as much mm. as anything. So, um, you know, there's a lot of advantages to this kind of research beyond just cutting emissions. Yeah, and I mean, on the emissions point, I personally don't think that we should be sacrificing the uh, humans, human progress to the environment. But regardless of your position on that, it certainly strikes me that innovation to do both, like this type of innovation that we're talking about, is a better solution than simply banning something, as yeah. they were trying to do in France with short haul flights, which you wrote an article on. Sure. Yeah, I think we put in that article in the description. Absolutely, yeah, and, yeah. and I, I'm very much in favor of research to cut emissions, and and you know, I, I think that's an a, a not it's not it's, it's an honorable thing to want to do if if you're you know concerned about the future of, of human civilization and you're concerned that our activity might be harming the environment, then trying to find productive ways to counter that I think is a good thing to do. What's right. not a good thing to do is lower our standard of living, exactly, out of concern for for nature, and you know that's what I want to fight and protect aviation from but if there are you know, people trying to invent technologies that make aviation cleaner greener safer all of that then then it's a wonderful thing and that's why i really wanted to celebrate this particular piece of research because i think it's it's got the potential to do that right that was exactly my point is that innovation and progress should be the solution to these problems not banning things and, and exactly. shutting things down yeah all right well i think that wraps it up for today um Sorry, went off a little bit about environmentalism, <laughs> but uh, today our big topics were AlphaFold 2, the artificial intelligence program that predicts the structures of proteins. Um, and then you talked about the cyanobacteria and how uh, its relation to astrophysics and the moon are helping us understand how life came to be on, on the Earth. Yes, uh, I laugh because every time I hear cyanobacteria, I think of Cyrano de Bergerac, and that was actually my way of remembering the name. But um, <laughs> love the if you haven't seen it. Definitely recommend. Yeah, and then on onto the honourable mentions. Um, you first talked about the um, crazy murder of spiders from Australia that might actually save you if you get heart disease. Um, I talked about photo, well, not photographing, but capturing, recording, studying the first um, directly observed supernova event as it happened. Uh, you talked about possible options for cheap uh, thermogenerators, and then I kept that thing going with hydrogen-fueled aircraft. All right. Some very exciting innovations. Thank you so much for joining us today on Innovation Celebration. Thank you.